Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the public online lecture series, Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities. The lecture series is arranged by the Mobility Lab of the University of Tartu within the Transport Planning Master, Master Thesis uh, level course. In this series, we seek to answer the question of how mobility analysis and transport planning can promote human scale, sustainable and just cities. We have invited here experts and leading scholars from the fields of human geography, transport planning, public health, sociology and more from Estonia, Europe and abroad. The lectures will take, take place until the end of April and more information you can find from the website transportplanning.ut.ee. If you have questions during the lecture, then please post them on chat. We will have the question and answer session in the end of this lecture. Today, we are very happy to welcome here Professor Tuuli Toivonen, who gives a lecture on analyzing accessibility and mobility for planning sustainable and equitable cities. Tuuli Toivonen is a professor of geoinformatics and the leader of the Digital Geography Lab at the University of Helsinki. Her research focuses on understanding the dynamics of people and places in both urban and natural areas, mostly using open or big data, spatial analytics, and machine learning approaches. Much of her work examines the mobility and accessibility of people from different perspectives and in different environments, using user-generated data, such as social media, mobile phone, sports application state, data, etc combined with traditional data sources. So welcome, Tuli, and now the screen is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Hake, and pleasure to see all of you here, both online and then, then in the room. Thanks for, for joining. Uh, I'm wondering now, I hope that you can now see my my screen properly in, on the... Uh, that's correct, that, that's correct. So, indeed, welcome everyone for, for the lecture. Uh, I titled my lecture, Analyzing Accessibility and Mobility for Planning of Healthy and Sustainable Cities. Now, as I've been doing the lecture, I realized that actually I will be talking mostly about accessibility modeling this time. And the reason for that is that as we stand here in the mobility lab in Tartu, uh, there is plenty of experience in analyzing mobility in-house. And I thought that I'll bring in something that we have been doing for a really long time in Helsinki, uh, in our digital geography lab, uh, and still continue doing, which is accessibility analysis, so that you would get a bit different view on, on this kind of transportation planning related spatial analysis. Uh, that might be relevant for you. Uh, and indeed, my name is Tuuli Toivonen. Uh, I'm a professor of, of geoinformatics, as said by Ake, uh, at the University of Helsinki, uh, and have been so for, for some years now, and earlier, earlier was, was a researcher and lecturer and, and many, many other things. Uh, and we have been working on these topics indeed since 2009, so it starts to be already uh, more, than, more than 10 years. And the platform for, for doing this research is, is indeed our research uh, group called Digital Geography Lab, uh, which some of you might be interested in, in checking out as well online. Uh, we do quite broad uh, research on spatial big data analytics to be analyzing um, fair and sustainable societies, their development, and to be so supporting their planning on human scale using big data, as said, and trying to do our research as openly as possible. And as none of the, or similar to none of the things that, that we usually do in research, this is not a one person show, even if every now and then one individual person is presenting the work, meaning that there's a big group of people behind these results. These are the current members of our lab, but there have been many others uh, contributing also to the presentation that I'm showing today. And one of them is Ake uh, here in the uh, organization team of this lecture series, uh, as she spent two years with us doing magnificent work on, uh, on human scale uh, cities and on analyzing equity uh, and health in or during, during everyday travels. 
And this is a research theme that we continue. But today I'll, I'll speak more, more broadly about, about accessibility in the spirit of the works that we do overall in our lab, which is that most of the work that we do somehow sort of base uh, on sustainable development goals with the idea that we try to be producing results that would be supporting somehow advancements in, uh, in sustainable societies and also equitable societies. And looking them indeed from the perspective of, of these big data analytics, spatial uh, analytics, and trying to understand social and spatial interactions and then human nature or people nature interactions as well through mobility access and accessibility. And today, what I'm concentrating mostly uh, on are these socio-spatial interactions and using accessibility uh, as one tool to be understanding the potential of people's interactions with each other. Uh, so, so that's the topic of today. And maybe one, one thing which is, which is interesting, I hope that it's, it's sort of orientating you to this theme as well, uh, is that why, why did we in the first place start to study accessibility and why did we get interested in it uh, and mobility as well, but, but accessibility maybe first. And the reason was really sort of everyday life uh, observation at the same time as it was scientific. So the, the fact that somehow when we think about our daily life in COVID times or without COVID, uh, we often need to be thinking where we are, where we need to go, how do we get there, how long does it take, uh, with which mode of transportation should I be going, how much does it cost, uh, what would be the optimal route, what would be the best mode of transportation for me or for anyone else with whom I'm going, uh, and then how much, for example, pollution it would be causing, or, or carbon dioxide, if I'm interested in, in such topics. I might also be interested in thinking about that, okay, what is the, the like health benefit and so on, but this is maybe a more reasoned thinking among, uh, among people. So this sort of practical thinking was one of the things that, that got us intrigued. Then another thing was that these are, these are now examples in Finnish, you, some of you might be picking something up from them, uh, but it's a like, constant debate on, on newspapers. I'm sure in Tartu, in Tallinn, in Estonia, in general, in Helsinki, in New York, uh, and so on. We talk about these everyday matters and how has the city been planned for our everyday mobilities and accessibility. And, and therefore, like having this constant debate between people makes it intriguing as well. And that, of course, relates to the fact that however we do our decisions, however the cities have been planned, actually accumulates to significant sort of impacts to the society. It might be that our actions cause land use change, we might need more parking space in urban setting, we might need uh, or might cause more transformation of even very native, native landscapes like this one from, from Amazonia. Uh, but in urban space, we might need to be compromising that, okay, do we take space from a park to be creating a road or a parking lot uh, for, for cars? Uh, so, so it's a matter of land use when, when we talk about uh, accessibility as well. Uh, it's, of course, a matter of climate change. It's a matter of economic and cultural uh, interactions or so possibilities for interactions and then equity and well-being of individuals. So huge questions, uh, huge global questions where planning has a role to guide people, but then ultimately people, individuals make the decisions of how they live their lives in that planned environment. And the planning is, of course, can be striving for, for like healthy and equitable and sustainable and everything nice. But if we don't sort of use that environment, use the services as the planner has been thinking, then this whole like goal is, is not being reached and actually we might be counter uh, productive in a way in, in terms of producing something good. Uh, and, and in that sense, how important it is to be recognizing the individual people's wishes uh, and 
views on, for example, accessibility when also planning uh, the, the urban setting. And then trying with planning to nudge people to go to a certain direction if we would like to be, for example, civic behavior or change. So, so these kinds of things are, are the intriguing background uh, like things that, that got us interested in these, these topics. And then I thought that today I would be discussing a bit something which is our sort of core thing or has been so modeling accessibility uh, using geospatial approaches and what kind of approaches there are, what kind of challenges there have been over the past 10 years, like emerging in, in research field uh, as, well as, as well as in planning. Uh, and then, then I would share share some of the newest things with you. So that was that was my idea for, for today. But I'm still confir confirming that how much do I have time until? Three quarters more. Three quarters more, that is good. Yeah, so first of all, maybe within this time of, of working, when, when we have been working with accessibility questions, so it has become somehow evident how important accessibility is for planning. So evident, of course, for, for us, but evident also for broader society. This has been known for long, as I'll show later on examples, but somehow, in at least in those cities that we follow, Helsinki being the one where we have been making most of our accessibility-related uh, research, but then following also other cities, accessibility has become, in a way, a tool to be understanding the complex developments of the urban region and how it functions. So somehow accessibility is a measure of, of functional city in a way, or accessibility can be used to, to measure the functionality, like functioning of the city and how well it functions. Uh, and this relates to, to the sort of planning spheres that, that somehow traditionally have been quite separate in many places. It's not the same everywhere, uh, but at least in Finland, we've had the same thing that, for example, transport planning, land use planning, planning of services, planning of housing, they all are carried out in their own sort of respective silos. And for example, the city of Helsinki is the biggest employer in, in Finland. We have 40,000 people working for the city of Helsinki or even more. Uh, many of them in healthcare services, but really many also in planning. So the planning department is, is huge for planning departments. Uh, and then it can happen that things are being planned uh, separately. Of course, there are processes that bring together the different plans, but still, uh, in terms of concepts and in terms of goals of that, what, what do we look at? Accessibility has been one that the planners have been identifying to be a shared concept, a shared thing that from different perspectives, the planners be like whether they come from the transport planning side, whether they come from land, land use planning side or from, from even other sides. So, so that is sort of a a shared uh, concept and a boundary object, if you will, that brings people together and allows them to be thinking about all these things jointly together. And that has led to, to different types of uh, accessibility analysis within the cities and beyond the city borders. Often originally from the perspective of economy and efficiency. So how do we plan an efficient city in a way? that travel times would be short, people would be able to reach places quickly and so on. But more recently, the tendency has been such that people are more interested also in, in the actual planning sphere to be making sure that the city is healthy for people, uh, livelihoods can be maintained, uh, it's equitable, and that the transportation uh, and, and the mobility in the city uh, can be carried out in sustainable Manner. And this has been a huge transformation in the thinking of those who are working with, with planning questions in, in cities. Uh, so, Giovanni and others, for example, stated that accessibility has become a central concept in physical planning in the past decades. And this is, this is really something which is visible also uh, in, in, if you go to EU level documents, uh, 
say, for example, the Green New, New, Green New Deal of, of EU. So there's a different or separate section for mobility and transport where these questions are being highlighted. If we look at our own urban strategy in Helsinki, that sort of starts with the idea that Helsinki is a good for Helsinki is for good life. So Helsinki on hyvä elämää varten, if you can be picking something from there. No, I don't know what happened. That's the screen. Which one is the touch screen? That one. What do I do? <laughs> Continue, maybe the mouse. The mouse. Just click to the next slide. Okay, and then back. Yeah, so Helsinki is for, for good life. And then it continues that the well-functioning city means that services are close by. One can safely walk to school. Old people can reach their services easily and transport is frictionless. So this is sort of good life. Uh, and the same goes on in, in almost all cities in, in Europe. And in Paris, for example, the mayor introduced uh, this kind of idea of a 15-minute city, which thereafter has been wiping <laughs> through the, the sort of city planning uh, discussions in, in the European Union, at least, and also in Europe uh, more, more broadly, with the idea that within 15 minutes, you should be able to reach the crucial destinations of your everyday life. And this then, of course, becomes the question of uh, equity uh, or equitability that who actually in the city has possibilities for this? So who can live in this way? Uh, and the idea is to be planning this for everyone, but in reality, uh, there might be, might be discrepancies or differences between people, and at least so that some areas need more attention and some, some then less, uh, or some, some are okay already. And in order to identify these areas that, okay, where do we need to be improving if we have such, a, such an idea? Uh, we, of course, need to be analyzing the current setting and then potentially to be predicting, predicting to the future and thinking that, that, okay, if we do so and so, so how does this uh, uh, environment change and how does the accessibility landscape in a way change for people? Uh, and only then we can sort of see for real if this is is happening and where do we need to be improving. And this then takes us to, to the sort of deep waters in a way, if, if you wish. So defining accessibility, even like here I've been talking now for too long already about accessibility sort of overall, but what actually is accessibility? Because we can't be really measuring it, okay? 15 minute city gives, gives an idea, but how do we like, how do we measure it? If you think about, this is Karst Geus, who's, who's one of the sort of all-time uh, leading figures of, of accessibility research. So he, uh, for example, posed this kind of question once, uh, and I, I wanted to be repeating the same, same question because I then thought that it was really, really good one. So if there are two, two sort of pictures here from two different sites in, uh, in the world, close by even. So which one is of higher accessibility? And then when you think about that, uh, okay, that place there, for example, you could be coming via the river and you could be coming via, via the road and there's even a railway, railway going and so on, some services around, or then this place. So for whom do you actually want to be sort of thinking about the accessibility? Is it for for people or for goods? Is it for pedestrians or is it for those who are driving by car? Animals. Animals, animals, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so you might be actually seeing a nice blackbird there having a good accessibility. Uh, but but that, those questions come. Uh, and then, then it's not actually anymore at all trivial that what is accessibility? And it is just this sort of difficult actually. Uh, so, so there's no, no single clear way of defining accessibility. And that is the, the sort of fundamental uh, challenge here that even if, if it's easy to talk about it, even if planners love the concept nowadays, uh, it brings people together still what it is actually and how then it should be measured is actually a bit difficult. And there, there have been attempts to, to define accessibility, but the attempts are all, all a bit challenging. So, so 
Gould, uh, for example, stated this, which doesn't yet, yet sort of help us, uh, which is that, that accessibility is a slippery notion. One of those common terms that everyone uses until faced with the problem of defining and measuring it. And this was already like 1969 that he said this. And we are now, where are we? 22, 2022. And still, this is very valid, holds completely. And, and the different uh, sort of attempts to be defining, defining accessibility are, are, are said very many. One of the most popular ones is, is by Hansen, uh, 1958. And you can see that we are like really far, uh, like, that was really a long time ago, and still we are discussing about these things. So the potential of opportunities for interaction is the most common uh, definition. The potential of opportunities for interaction. So how can we usually in physical space be in interaction with each other if we are, for, ex for example, interested in uh, accessibility of people and between people? Then there are later, later attempts by Luca Bertolini, for example, the amount uh, and diversity of places of activity that can be reached within a given travel time and or cost. So there he takes in already travel time as one of the fundamental things defining accessibility, it goes more specific. Uh, and then Benenson and others say that the ability of people to reach and participate in activities so it's activities which are interesting from the perspective of Benenson. And there are these. Uh, somehow, to me, the potential of opportunities for interaction is quite is, is really nice general way of defining accessibility. And then what is seen is that actually, depending on the question, it often is uh, between people, accessibility, or people and activities or locations of activities that, that are being analyzed. And then as you can see, as we sort of move forward, is that travel time, as in Bertolini's definition, uh, is one of the fundamental things in accessibility modeling that almost every accessibility model somehow has uh, travel time and time in the background. Uh, well then, as I decided to be keep sort of almost deleting from my title this mobility part, uh, as I did, this is now mostly on accessibility, what I'm talking about. So it's important to notice that we have been studying our research group mobility as well uh, a lot. And somehow, that what, what is the difference then? So if accessibility is the potential of opportunities for interaction. So then mobility can be seen as realized behavior in that accessibility landscape, that sort of landscape, landscape of opportunities. So how do we then use that landscape of opportunities in our daily life, for example, is then sort of realized with mobility. And both of them are in, important to understand when really wanting to understand that how uh, equitable or healthy or human scale cities are. But with accessibility, we can be seeing the potential, which is the starting point for, for everything else. And with mobility, often we can test whether our assumptions of accessibility and the accessibility landscapes actually hold. So do people actually use this potential at all? So then thinking about uh, how then to analyze this complex matter of accessibility. Uh, well, it, it's again, like as you could see from the sort of definitions of, of the concepts, it's not at all a new thing. Accessibility analysis have been made uh, for centuries. So von Thurman's models, uh, for example, where, which you have encountered, I'm sure, so they were sort of accessibility models. They were sort of models of, of the uh, distance from, from the center and how land use changes based on, based on the distance. And the distance there, uh, or it was also time to be traveling from your residential city center or locations to, to the further, further outskirts of the city uh, were based on, on either distance or, or travel time. And the idea was that, that the more remote you are, uh, that, that influences then, then the land use. 
Uh, similarly, like in the 70s, in terms of accessibility research, there was a lot of work being done uh, also in, in mobility research, but also accessibility uh, by uh, Hegerstrand with space time geography, with the idea that, that actually our potential of interaction was defined uh, by these space time prisms. So we are in a certain location uh, in space and we have a limited time budget to be using our surroundings. So then, what is our sort of real? Uh, like spectrum of opportunities within that prism of, of time. And, and that was another approach already from the, from the 70s. And at the moment, what we are doing when analyzing accessibility is actually sort of deriving from these old models, uh, old approaches, some of the conceptual thoughts, uh, and then implementing the analysis using big and open data sources, special data. And usually, uh, then thinking still about the complexity of the of the problem, uh, we can take very different approaches to to accessibility modeling and analytics. We can be infrastructure based. Based. We can be interested in uh, questions that relate to transport planning. So, for example, that how um, how much capacity can. Oh, oh, I'm doing something again. So I don't need to be touching it, it seems. <laughs> Can I have a stick? So is it that, does it take a stick as well? Or is it? Um, not sure. Okay, I'm, I'm careful, I'm more careful. Also. So whether we concentrate or focus on infrastructure, as most transport planners, for example, are of course interested in the transportation infrastructure and whether the capacity of say public transportation is good enough in certain routes. Uh, what are the time needs and or, or transportation needs, what are the time limits, and so on, with the focus of being efficient uh, and serve, serve the city in a way from efficiency perspective. Then there are these location-based approaches, which often are used from urban and regional planning perspective in urban studies. So in what time people can be reaching their uh, favorite or needed services, uh, and then also that, that what services are available for, for people. So place-based starting point to be understanding the potential of reaching, for example, uh, services. Or for services to be reaching people also, or customers, for example, that, that way around as well. Then thinking about the Hegerstrand uh, time uh, geography and space time approach, uh, those clearly had like an individual perspective that from individual perspective, what is, for example, the activity space of the person, what is in reach indeed during that, or with that uh, prism of, of time that people had, uh, and then, then what was feasible. Uh, from that perspective. And then still another one uh, approach, and these are, by the way, from Gerson Van B, 2004, uh, classic, classic, classic uh, accessibility paper. So, so economic evaluations from utility-based perspective have been a sort of fourth major trend in accessibility research. And then in, in all of these, but with different weights, uh, often similar components uh, of, of accessibility are brought together. So so-called land use component, uh, so a modern quality uh, and spatial distribution of opportunities and destina destinations often demand for opportunities, often also conflicts between supply and demand are, are being considered in those. Then the transportation component, uh, thinking about the location and characteristics of the transportation systems, how they change over time, uh, how well they are able to be, transport people between origins and destinations. Then the temporal com component, so how do all of these change over time usually are considered. And then the individual co component might or sometimes is considered. So needs, abilities and opportunities of individuals. And this is sort of the theoretical uh, identification of Theos and Van Vee that what in a way should be analyzed, should be taken into account when analyzing accessibility. And for real, uh, we are only getting there at the moment. And I'll show you, show you why uh, this is. But these this sort of are, are needed. Information about the origins and lo 
locations and activities, uh, transportation system characteristics of the transportation network in a way, and then information about people. So, so these have been defined uh, as the starting point. But then in practice, this has been really difficult to do. And the most, like, the way how accessibility has been measured, even if there has been this identification that, that these are the things that we should take into account, has been super uh, simplistic uh, for, for long. So there have been different measures uh, of, of like transportation network, for example, very simple, even from like those from, from Fontune and like the, the distances. Uh, that, that were in, in the classic, classic figure are still something that are being used. So, so just Euclidean distance uh, is in some cases used as a measure of accessibility. Uh, so how accessible is a place? Uh, so then you think that, okay, what is in, in certain distance from, from that place? With the increasing like complexity nowadays, a no normal thing to do is, is a network distance and then increasingly the functional distance. And that is almost always the time, time spent on the route. And the time is so important probably because it is uh, the one which is most easily understood by people. It is also very easy to be analyzed. But what is not actually easy is that how should we value time? For many of us, if you think about your own daily lives, depending a bit on your life situation, time might be the most precious good that you, or whatever it is, precious amenity that you have uh, and that you try to optimize all the time. And that is in a way in, in accessibility research, the starting point. And, and some, uh, in some planning exercises, at least at the city of Helsinki, the, even a time, even a price for, for an hour has been defined in such a way that one could be converting the time to money, because then it's easier still to be communicating. It's easy, easy to communicate about time, but it would be even easier to communicate about money when decisions, big decisions are being made. But okay, we save this and this much time, meaning this will produce this and this much productive money in a way, if we do a change in transportation network, for example, and therefore improve accessibility. And, and this all comes from the idea that shorter travel, travel times mean better accessibility and mean saving for the society, and then uh, this, that is better. And, and that, that is like still the way how we mostly analyze accessibility. Uh, well then, going to more like, like technical. So, so in terms of how this then has been in geography, in geoinformatics, in transportation planning, uh, and in urban planning, how it has been sort of realized is that we do uh, often network analysis uh, using street network data, which, which is topologically sound, meaning that the network has been created in such a way that, that the nodes are, are connected, that they allow this kind of uh, network analysis uh, that has sort of correct geometry so that it really resembles the, the network that people are using for their uh, mobility. For example, of course, for roads it's easy, but then for walking uh, it's much more difficult. So what are the routes that we actually use for walking? So are they those that are mapped as roads or are they actually paths in the urban structure or in, in parks or forests? Uh, and having, of course, that kind of information available, which resembles realistic use of the transportation network is important. But traditionally, this has been done uh, mostly with cars, then thinking that, okay, road network is what we need. We need then speed limits, and that's almost it. Sometimes we might be needing turning information, like whether it's allowed to be turning right or left, or which streets are one-way streets, and, and so on in order to be doing correct uh, routing, correct uh, estimation of, of travel types. Uh, and then these are being sort of, these estimates are being done usually with, with routing and again with very classic algorithms like Dijkstra from, again, from 1959 uh, is the one which is still with improvements the most used uh, 
tool to be creating a route for people or between places and then understand also accessibility patterns. And still the most common way of doing this analysis for planning is, is this kind. Like this is now the travel time to Helsinki railway station with speed limits only using the road network. And this is 20 minutes, uh, like the area be, being reached in 20 minutes uh, according to the road routing uh, and speed limits only uh, from, from the central railway station. But then if you think that whether this is now realistic, again, the question, which I'm, and my whole point is to be challenging you to be thinking about this question. Uh, if we so, sort of just develop this a bit further, uh, and we think that, okay, we are there by car, uh, we want to be going to, to the railway station, uh, but then there's congestion, there are also others. In, uh, in there. And actually, I would need to be parking and I would need to be first walking to the car. I would need to take it. I would need to drive according to the speed limits. There's congestion. Then I need to park it and then I need to be going to the railway station. So uh, what in terms of time do I actually consider? Uh, and then when you implement these things to the model uh, and start routing with these things in mind, so then 20 minute uh, like catchment area is of this sort. So that changes that much uh, when we introduce more realistic uh, matters, more, more things uh, that actually impact for real accessibility, but in the simplest form are not taken into account. And then if you think about this and the way that, okay, many of the cities have been planned from this perspective when simple transportation or simple accessibility analysis have been carried out, 15 minute city, for example. Okay, we do this kind of mapping and then we see that, that which places are reachable within 15 minutes and we draw conclusions. So we can really go wrong, as you can see. And, and then the other thing where we can really go wrong is that, okay, but not, if, we're not, if we are not there by car, so what is the value of this kind of road network based analysis actually? Well, it's, it's not really that valuable. If we do this kind of analysis to the analyzing 15 minute city, for example, then we assume that everyone is there by car. And then we plan the city for the car, don't we? So, so in a way, what you analyze actually, of course, comes from the question, but sometimes as this is easy to do and something else might be more difficult, we sort of end up, end up in creating analysis results that then support developments which are not what we are actually seeking for. And therefore, sort of raising this point, which is super simplistic, uh, but still I think is useful for the reason that we would be really careful in thinking that what do we actually analyze when we analyze things? So do we go the easiest way or do we really put effort on trying to make or trying to answer the question that we want to be answering? And in this case, I guess, if thinking about the 15 minute city, we should change completely the network that we use for the, for the analysis uh, and the modes of transportation and then add on uh, components that are more difficult than taking into account congestion, parking or walking times with a car driving uh, use. And why this is sort of important to emphasize is that, that I picked this from Twitter from last week, and I thought that it was such such a fantastic one. That this is uh, if our home was planned as our cities, so what would it look like? Uh, and still, even if we think that our cities are sort of increasingly being planned for other modes of transportation than car, so from or because of the developments of this or past century, still often it is so that, that the car has been put to the center of the city development, which then means that most decisions have been originally at least made uh, using the, the previous types of accessibility analysis. And this is of course now changing completely, like this is from Helsinki, City of Helsinki, Liikennesuunnittelun tavoitteet, so goals of the transportation planning. And this is the first time, this was 2017, the first time when the city of Helsinki announced that they will be putting walking people, like pedestrians first. 
never earlier it had been stated really. It had been this kind of car approach, not really stated that who are the, the people with, mo with modes of transportation we plan or to which modes of transportation do we plan the cities. And this was sort of radical change that then they expressed for the first time that, okay, uh, so the first principle is to be taking into account those who are on foot. And then it grows from there, okay, biking, public transportation, and car is the last one. So car can be slowed as long as the other ones are functional, basically. And, and this has then been seen also in many of the analyses. So when we then have this kind of political or politically set, set uh, sort of goal or valuing of, of different types of uh, people in the city, it of course means that we also have to be revisiting completely the different ways how we analyze accessibility. So the potential of interaction. And then there has been a lot of development to create multimodal comparable measures uh, for travel time and accessibility. So multimodal, not only car, but multimodal, and then that creates a need to be thinking those also jointly. So how do we then compare them together? Uh, and this is work that, that has been done, like we've done with Maria Salonen, who's, who's one of the, uh, from our, our department even, one of the first PhDs who defended on this topic. So, so this is quite sort of, sort of interestingly, a lot of great paper still now from 2013, uh, modeling travel time in urban networks, comparable measures for private car and public transportation. For the reason that it sort of highlights the idea that in order for us to compare, for example, accessibility landscapes of those who are on, uh, on car and public transportation, we need to be creating comparable measures. So not only measures, but also comparable measures. Uh, and this is something that, that then uh, we have been, oh, this is in Finnish, sorry about that. Uh, we have been developing with the idea of de developing this kind of door-to-door -door approach, meaning that when we analyze, for example, car driving, we are not happy with the uh, routing only along the road network, but we really have to be taking into account the parking times as well and the, the uh, ingress and egress uh, sort of stretches as well. For public transportation, we really need to be think thinking about the real timetables of public transportation to be creating realistic uh, timetable or accessibility models and also to be considering, for example, the time that one has to be waiting for the public transportation, that it's not there immediately. And then, of course, walking and cycling. Uh, there we have those, those challenges of, of sort of really using, for example, the network that people really use. And then to be really knowing that what is actually the speed that people go about. With car driving, people drive more or less with the same speed that the sort of flow goes if they respect the, uh, the speed limit. But if we think about all of us as bikers, for example, I guess that if we would take our bikes and we would make a free flow uh, drive from here to, say, the Lona Keskus. Kiss is an interesting place here, I've understood. So I guess that it would, would be taking a bit different time from each of us because we are different, not because the road network would be different, but because we are different and we like to be doing things differently. And, and that becomes then actually a crucial thing in this sector uh, when, when trying to, to model those. Uh, how this then has been sort of changing is that Earlier, we simply could not do much more than the very simple car analysis. Actually, in Finland, by like thinking about the simple car routing, only in 2004, which is now how many years ago? 16 years ago, uh, we got the first national road network data that contains speed limits and these turning restrictions. That was the only time, like that, only after that, we have been able to make uh, real accessibility models for a car with these principles, simple things. So only within that time. Uh, and now then, of course, we've gone, gone much, much further. So we have good data sets uh, for, for car uh, networks, 
and increasingly good for also pedestrians and cyclists data. Open street map, for example, which some of you might be familiar with. So that is one of the data sources that globally uh, is thought to con contain most used uh, networks of, of people, individuals. And that is, as you might know, a citizen science effort created by all of those who are interested in their environment, mapping the routes that they actually use, uh, allowing then also us who are analyzing accessibility to take into account those real routes and not something that has been on the plans to be used. And then, of course, in terms of, uh, of uh, for example, public transportation, there are different data sources like uh, GTFS or now R5, which includes routing options or open trip planner uh, as, as routing tools to create standardized ways of routing and therefore accessibility modeling as well for public transportation. So we've been going really far uh, during the past 15 years or so in terms of data access uh, and then also in development of comparable methods. So we start to be quite well off in, in this, this respect. Uh, and then, of course, this has led to, to different uh, tools, like open tools, open uh, approaches that are available throughout from different cities in the world, or then which are generalizable, uh, for example, for public transportation throughout, throughout the world. Uh, and then it has led to open data sets and by in case there are some students particularly who, who might be interested in, uh, in analyzing some accessibility questions later on. So, reveal uh, some of these, these differences of accessibility landscapes uh, with different modes of transportation. So this one, for example, here is the city of city center of Helsinki. So this one, for example, shows the most reachable, most accessible areas by a private car in the Helsinki region. And those are actually in, in the, not in the city center, but in the ring roads. And that is where the biggest shopping centers are. And that is why I think there is now a huge concern about the city center lively, liveliness uh, in, in the evening times and so on. Because those are so good places uh, to go in terms of accessibility. But this is only one part of the uh, picture. If we look at the same thing with public transportation, so then the most accessible places are these grid spots. Meaning that when, for example, then designing the, say, public services of the city, so which accessibility landscape do we look at makes a huge difference, and for whom do we actually want to be putting those services to? So these are things to consider and things that, that have been used then uh, in many, many different analyses. One of the complex, like adding on on the complication uh, is that, of course, now there are new transport modes, uh, self-driving vehicles, scooters, other things that really are difficult to model. And this is now, if somebody is interested in, in sort of researching these issues, there's a bunch of new questions again with the, with the introduction of new transport modes that nobody has really predicted. This one, yes, but nobody had thought that, for example, uh, these e-scooters would be, would be so popular in the future. And then, this is now about uh, identifying different modes of transportation and the different accessibility landscape for, for different modes. But then, of course, things change also over time, don't they? It's not static. Uh, so, particularly if we want to be thinking that, okay, our society is individually or, or increasingly individual, we have flexibility in our working times, uh, we have flexibility of, of service opening hours. Uh, for example, shops are open 24-7 in, in many places in the world, have been classically, but now also in the Nordic countries. Uh, there's more concern about the equity questions and the accessibility landscapes at different times of the day. And this has been raised, for example, in, in Helsinki, there is this Nasima Rasmiar, who, uh, who is a vice, uh, vice mayor, so he has now established this kind of it has been running now for, for two years or so, Yöluotsi, 
she is called the person who's responsible of nighttime Helsinki and seeing that equitably uh, services are available for everyone, even if they would be, for example, working on unusual hours. Of course, at, at nighttime, not everything can be the same as in daytime, but this is being considered. And this then also means that there is a need for, for analyzing this increasingly. Uh, Olle Järvi, who some of you might know, uh, who is from here originally, so defended his thesis in the mobility lab, but has been with us for long. And then, for example, Reina who I'm sure all of you know, know well. Uh, so we made earlier, uh, some time ago already, uh, this kind of paper about the accessibility modeling uh, as function of time. So how do we actually take uh, temporal changes into account? So when trying to be multimodal, that's good already, but then things change over time. So how do we consider that? And that starts from the girls and one way thinking uh, that we have different components uh, that we need to take into account, but then also the time. As all of these three other things uh, activity locations, transport network, and people are actually uh, mobile or, or changing over time. Uh, dynamic would be the best, best word. So activity locations change over time due to, for example, even if thinking about one day and night. So just because of opening hours, uh, we have transportation network experiencing either scheduling of public transportation or then experiencing, for example, uh, con congestion on, on the uh, car driving. Or it might also be experiencing changes of, for example, like if you think about walking, well, walking is the same day and night, isn't it? But then if there are places where you really don't want to go at night, so then actually some of the like the road network in a way changes for us. So the actual uh, road network, which is available for us to use at night time, might be changing. And if we want to be really understanding the net transportation network, we need to be, and it changes over time, we need to be knowing about this. And then, of course, people change their locations. Classically, transportation or accessibility modeling starts from people at home. But here we are. <laughs> like not not home uh, and as you know from from the work from from mobility lab you have been doing really a lot of work in modeling people's whereabouts and dynamic population and this is something which is crucial in accessibility modeling as well to know where people are in order to be really making realistic accessibility models for those people who we want to be reaching and in this paper by Olle and and, and others we did actually an analysis in Tallinn, so if you're interested in, in looking at it, uh, you might want to dive into that, that paper as it's from, from here. Uh, and it, what it is revealing is, is this kind of dynamic uh, accessibility uh, ch or changes of, of the accessibility landscape uh, over 24 hours of a normal, normal weekday. And this was a demonstration only uh, of the idea of the dynamic accessibility approach over and perhaps of interest to you. What it showed in the end is that it makes, makes a huge difference uh, if we include the temporal aspect or not, but actually most of the change comes from the service network in the case of Tallinn and in the case of physics. But still considering all of these dynamisms of all of these different components, uh, makes it more realistic to be making the, the transportation or accessibility models. So then just to highlight that again, if you would be interested in analyzing something yourselves, so there is a data set available also for this purpose. Uh, so population data, uh, which is 24 hour uh, sensitive for Helsinki area is something that we just released uh, and described in scientific data with Claudia Barilut and others, data by Elisa, the mobile phone company, and it's freely available for anyone to, to analyze. And in, in that sense, even if you have been using a lot of mobile phone data in your studies, the fact that we were able to release this openly as open data was, to our thinking, quite, quite interesting. And this, of course, allows us to be doing the accessibility analysis of different parts, taking into account this sort of 
uh, population dynamics of different different places. So this is only the number of population, and then we used it in the paper to be uh, modifying accessibility models so that they are dynamic as well. So in this way, we were able to introduce people and the changing people, uh, changing locations of people into these accessibility models. But then when thinking about the complexity of, of us, uh, we really, as we were talking about this, so we are really not moving equally. So this guy or these guys might be moving with very different speeds. And then the Lucra biker or runner would be walking in, in a completely different speed. And this is something which is almost completely not taken into account yet in any accessibility models. And that is to me like, it's such a simple and, and normal thing, but it, those models don't really exist. And the city planning doesn't really yet in their analysis, at least the ones that we've seen, don't take these things into account. There are some starts of this analytics, for example, from the perspective of older people. Uh, in Norway, they have been tracking the walking speeds of people uh, of different ages and how it reduces over time. So if we want to be creating a 15 minute city for 80 plus, or if we want to be creating it for us, it's a different case, even if we do it by walking which is the simplest uh, way of, of, work, of operating in a way. So this is still sort of in process. So we are all the time, as you can be seeing, trying to improve the measures of accessibility, the potential of interaction, so that they would be increasingly realistic, increasingly take into account the different uh, modes of transportation, different times of day, different types of people, uh, and then give a possibility to be really analyzing. Or only then, in a way, we can be having the possibility to analyze how equitable, for example, the accessibility of a place is, uh, or what should be improved. And this is now, hopefully, in the process in many cities of, of uh, Europe and also, also elsewhere. So we need more awareness, more capabilities of analyzing these, these things. But then also we need more analysis, testing of these accessibility models with realized mobility. So are they actually, as said, representing something which is then realized in everyday activities of people? And then we might need completely new measures. And that last point is something where, when do I need to end now? Like in five minutes. In five minutes. So then I say still this, this thing. Because this is something that we are now sort of starting to work on top of everything else which there is. Together with Ake, together with, with the bigger, bigger group of people, hopefully we are hiring more, more people to be, to be studying these things. With the idea that as all of this that I've been talking about now is based on time, indeed. So travel time has been a fundamental thing all the time, even if we take into account different things. So what else happens during travel than just or spending of time? So that is something that, that accessibility modeling and also mobility analysis is at the moment sort of figuring out. So trying to move beyond travel time, thinking about the utility of time. So how does the time become useful even when on travel? And what is the quality of the travel environment? And, and these are two things that, that increasingly come out. Meaning that, okay, if you're in private car, you can be listening to your French classes, maybe. But otherwise, you have to be concentrating on, on the actual driving. But when you're in a bus or in a, a train, you can be using the time in different ways. And some people have been analyzing already for some time ago this kind of uh, production or productivity of, of the travel uh, time, but then to be implementing it into the models of accessibility, it hasn't happened yet. So could this be one way of changing the time-centered aspect of travel into something else, is something that, that is now being discussed. And then the other thing is the quality of the travel environment. So what do we actually see, experience, feel, smell here when on travel? And how does that influence 
for example, the healthiness and the pleasantness of the travel. And that is super important, of course, if you want to be having people more biking or more on foot. So if it's horrible and ugly, people are not going to do it. But if it's pleasant and feels healthy in a way, then you might be more inclined in doing that. And even sort of from planetary health perspective, in order to save, save the planet, uh, we have to be considering uh, these things as well. And therefore, not sort of concentrating on the time, because time most, in most cases is the most energy consuming, most fuel consuming. If you optimize time, you always end up driving a car, or almost in accessibility models. So you have to be actually also seeing the other things than time in order to see the value of these different <laughs> transportation, for example. And there then what we have now been working on with, with OK and, uh, and others is, is that we've tried to be sort of understanding the different uh, either realized mobilities or then the accessibility landscapes from the perspective of other, other things as well. So how much air quality, uh, bad air quality we get exposed to, how much noise exposure we experience, how much green exposure we we experience. Can we even think about measuring aesthetic exposure, so or aesthetic experiences, and so on? And these are the things that we we indeed try to be try to be now modeling. Uh, and that takes us to my last last sort of question or thought that I would like to be putting to your head is that is there now a conceptual regular in accessibility research somehow? That do we, after refining and refining uh, how we sort of think about accessibility and the potential of interaction from the perspective of time used to come together, either between places or between people, so do we actually need to be starting to think that how much do we consume when doing so, or what do we gain from that actual movement that happens between places? So on top of the so-called social floor that we think, which is provided by this kind of 15-minute city concept that everyone would have good access to services on foot, perhaps uh, equal to everyone. So do we also need to be, do we need to start thinking also a sort of ecological ceiling that, okay, if we do that, so what, on what ecological cost, on what health benefit? And with that, I would like to be finishing. And then we can discuss with those with who are local. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for, for this presentation. And indeed, now it's the time for uh, questions and discussion, and also our online audience. If you have uh, a question, please raise your hand, or then uh, post a question to the chat. And we start here from our local members. So whether you have any comments or questions to do it. I would ask that if you said that accessibility is mostly measured by time, uh, how long it takes, for example, to get from a point to a store. And the time is based on uh, walking speed, but walking speed varies between ages. Then wouldn't a better measure be length? For example, a young person uh, can look at, okay, it's 500 meters. I can walk this in a couple of minutes, it's no problem. An elderly person would see how it's 500 meters, it takes quite a time, it's not accessible. Yeah, probably so for, for those who, like if, if the intention is to be giving root information, like information to individuals, so then, then that might work also that, that we could be saying that, okay, my walking speed is this and this, and then we could, could get personalized uh, instructions and personalized measures. But then if we think about planning, so planning often needs to have generalized values uh, and over a whole, it's not like routing uh, from place to place, but the routing is, is a tool to be getting this kind of understanding of the accessibility landscape around us. And for that purpose, then I think that the sort of more meaningful approach would be to be questioning that what is, what are the values that we are using with the thinking that often uh, planning in this case starts from the idea of a average person, or at least the modeling that serves planning, that we use like average walking speeds or average biking speeds, 
And I think that what would be useful is or would be to create models for those who are slow and models for those who are fast or models from those in between to be making it visible that if you are uh, really slow for whatever reason, then actually the accessibility landscape looks completely different and making that visible sort of re remembering to make also those versions of of whatever accessibility landscape one is presenting, to me, would be a good way forward, which is not implemented that much or thought even. Yeah, it's thought, but then like everyone is busy and we just wait to make one map because that, that fits the report and then the decisions are made based on that one map, even if everyone thought that we remember to think that this is not the truth. So therefore, like those who are making the analysis, so forcing in the idea that there is variation and remember that there can be also this slow walker, or then if only one map or one result would need to be chosen. So of course, from the equity perspective, choosing the one which is based on the slowest would be fair in a way. Uh, I have a question about the, also about the planning. So as you mentioned, uh, we plan, for example, 15 minute city, or we take the temporal uh, temporal factor as a basis to plan things. And in the end of the presentation, you also brought in the basically perceived temporal length, which which may be quite different from the actual time when, when it's more greener and etc. So, and I can totally understand why it's easier to only take time as a factor, it's more easily measurable. But, but what do you think should actually be used in planning or what should be the first, um, purpose? Is it the actual time or is it really important to take into account the perceived time more? Yeah. Well, maybe I'm, I'm not sure whether it's the perceived time that is the sort of the other thing that should be taken into account. It could be the normal time. It's considered or it, it's shown that, that people perceive time really differently in different conditions. So that, that is one thing. Uh, but still, like having time, either perceived or the real, real time, uh, is maybe the, the thing that I would like to challenge. For the reason that then if we optimize time, uh, so then indeed we end up in consuming ways of behavior. But if we would be optimizing, for example, uh, <coughs> calories burned or active mobility, I think that that is uh, something where we, like during the travel, we gain two things. We move from one place to another, but at the same time, we exercise our sort of physical body. And we might be also experiencing something. So that, that the travel time is actually an experience of the environment, which might be valuable. So that, that is something that, that I would like to see more. And then on very practical terms, of course, analyzing, for example, the CO2 uh, outcome. So it's not time, time is not going to disappear from accessibility models ever. It's so, so important in our society. But having on top of that, like other measures as well, or having next to it other measures that, okay, if we are able with this kind of improvement or change in the transportation network or the service network to change the travel times and the accessibility landscape this way, travel time based. So then the, the sort of cost of doing that in terms of, for example, CO2 uh, or less exposure to greenery or more exposure to poor air quality is this. So that, that's maybe what, what I'm sort of after, that there would be several measures, not 15 minute city, or it could be the starting point, but that there should be a ceiling as well, saying that we can't be, if we try to be reaching these short distances in time, we have to be having also sort of ecological or health ceiling that we can't do it with the expense of producing more. Uh, carbon, for example. Maybe somebody wants to be explaining this better. Yeah, sure, sure. So, like, I fully, fully agree with your um, approach in that sense that if accessibility in the early definitions was the potential for interaction 
then can it also include the effects of interaction? So the costs of interaction. So we already also see flight chain. So the, the destinations are uh, time-wise very accessible and then budget-wise very accessible very often, but actually the cost uh, of this accessibility, high accessibility is very high. Yeah. And, uh, and, and also then for, for health, if we experience uh, also this 15 minute city in poor air quality environment, for example. So what does that cost for us? So how can we name, rename this 15 minute city concept, which is a great concept, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but just to include this, uh, these other aspects, these health aspects and climate aspects and biodiversity aspects as well. Well, I think that in the 15 minute city thinking, often it is thought that it should be by walking, that by walking in 15 minutes, you should be reaching certain things. And then, of course, it goes, everything is included in there, but it's not always so. Mm -hmm. uh, and there we should be sort of rem remembering to have that we can, we can be attempting to reach good accessibility in terms of time, but we can't be doing it the cost of the other things, at least too high cost of other things. But there's really little studies on that, so that there's really little evidence, for example, that if we measure with time and with other things, so how does it look like? These far the accessibility landscapes are these kind of multimodal, that okay, how, how does the accessibility landscape look like for bike and for car? But then how does it look like for greenery and uh, travel time? So those are almost non-existent. And something that, that we try to work on, but also others. We have this, you have this for uh, the division of four uh, boxes uh, of, of, of the accessibility concept is where um, you can study accessibility from the perspective of, of infrastructure or location or utility or individuals. So this 15 minute uh, city concept, where would you locate? I guess that it would be from, well, it, it would, that, that's of course like forceful <laughs> classification. So, so it would be somewhere in the middle, but I guess that it does start from the individual perspective in a way, from the perspective of, of individual people and their 15 minute uh, prison in a way. Yeah. Do you know that whether Helsinki has this kind of information now when time exists? But there are people with different uh, needs, different requirements, different abilities for services from personal perspective, and where are then the, the areas where to improve? No, I, uh, to my knowledge, it has not been like it has been discussed in Helsinki, but I don't think that any analysis yet has been made to be to be really showing that where are the places we are currently working with Elias Hilberg, who some of you know. Uh, on and Chris Fink uh, on, on a project which is about elderly people's mobilities and elderly people's accessibilities in cities. And in that one, we now try to be making this kind of uh, analysis where we compare the simple 15 minute city concept for an average person and for an older person uh, and see that how does it differ even. And those examples we haven't found. From Norway, we found these measurements of, of walking speed. Uh, but otherwise, so that they would have been taken into even the simple accessibility uh, analysis. Uh, scientific literature is quite scarce on that, even if I'm sure that in planning offices they, they have been making those in other cities, but not in Helsinki. Thank you. I think it is a really interesting uh, overview about this accessibility. I really like this uh, more like the ideas that this has to be in the future to cover all this accessibility to, to all of us. <laughs> but, but my first, uh, um, I don't know, is more comment or questions that uh, how it would be uh, to cover or think about this uh, the multimodality that it also uh, brings some difficulties to, to you have to change all the time, uh, not all the time, but you have to change the uh, mobility types or the, the transportation modes, and how it should be also bring more difficulties to, to not, not only for the time you have to wait there and to, to time schedules and so on, but also some um, to use the digital solutions or to, to you have to know all these things. Yeah, that is actually very relevant, like, like the 
the perceived accessibility from the perspective that how difficult it is to be using certain mode of transportation. That's what, what you're sort of saying, is it? That, that knowing, like, and, and that is a real thing uh, in a way that it's easier to be driving a car for some, uh, be, not because it would be faster, but, but because you know how it works. And then the, the fuzziness of the public transportation system might be complicated for, for some. So, so that, that creates a layer of, of hindrance in using the service and knowledge in and good information services certainly are one way of improving accessibility, also the physical accessibility, when you really know where you go and, and so on. So that, that certainly is one of the tools which I think cities are moving actively uh, in order to promote certain modes of transportation, that it would be easy to do the, the trips that you have to do uh, by providing information. And I guess that in, in that, like, the real, like if some of the examples of, of the sort of theoretical literature come from 1960s or 50s. So still at the moment, we are in the situation where this actual modeling and taking these things first to the users, like to, to provide the information becomes possible, but then also the analysis becomes possible, as we can also be following people, the realized mobilities, the hindrances that they might have uh, in the realized mobility patterns, uh, and then take those under our scrutinization and see that, okay, where are the problems and where to put more information, for example, or where to improve the connections otherwise. And, and I did have a slide about the availability of data, overall uh, open data and then big data, and how this actually now changes the whole, whole game for this actual analytics, even if the theory has been there for, for really long. Some more questions? Yeah, I have a sh short question. I just started to wonder, are there any, let's say, simple accessibility analysis just taking into account time, but that they are done in different seasons? Because here in our horizon, let's say, we have winter conditions and summer conditions. So the speed limits vary, some of the cycle routes are maintained, some of them are not. And when it's slippery, it also depends, but are there any, or, are there many studies like that or not really? No, seasons are like in scientific literature, except for biology and so on. Uh, so like in urban studies, seasons are to me a forgotten study topic. I, I'm always astonished how little they are being studied. And we have this big project starting now where Ake is involved as well. And, mm -hmm. and Janika is, is following closely as well from, from the lab. So, so their seasonality is one of the questions, like how does seasonality change the experience of greenery, for example. That, that's a big different topic, but related. But for example, urban park research doesn't recognize that there are seasons. Like all, all the like benefits of parks, you go in summer and you experience them in summer. And how like how long is summer here? Like three months or something. And the rest uh, is, is not that. So so that is to me like yeah, really, really astonishing. And the same goes with accessibility research. So there have been some studies recently. The the Norwegian chaps who, who for example, did this one. Uh, the well, anyways, no, this is too complicated. The, the one where there were the speed limits of, or speed speeds of people. Uh, so they also analyzed uh, different conditions. And we have now sort of following their like example, we have been clocking at how slow or fast fast people are in walking when it's super slippery and when it's not. And simple, simple, simple thing, but still even that kind of information is not available. Uh, so so that is being being done here in north, but then of course in, in south as well, in southern cities, the seasonality becomes really an issue when, when it's hot. Uh, so whether you dare to go out, it's not maybe the speediness, it might be that as well, but really the, do you even go is, is a question. And that can't be really modeled with accessibility modeling, but then it's a mobility analysis. But even then, with the mobility analysis, one should be concentrating not only on those who make the trip, but also 
to those who don't make the trip who stay at home because it's too slippery or because it's too hot or because there's too much air pollution or something else and that that i think has been really little really studied i've noticed that when i walk to when i walk here from home uh, during summer or spring it takes 15 minutes but in the winter the time suddenly increases to 20 minutes although i seem to be walking uh, at the same pace but for some reason, I'm always late in the winter because the road pavements aren't clean from snow and it's slippery, and then there's some ice that's hanging on buildings and a hundred obstacles to dodge. Yeah. But these people, for example, found that the fastest, now oh, I don't remember, so forgive, forgive me if I'm wrong, but, but I think it is so, uh, that the fastest speed is like minus five. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, we, we discussed about it and, and the only solution that we sort of got, the only reason we, we got was that, that it's a bit unpleasant. Uh, it's not too slippery, but it's a, a bit unpleasant. So if you have the sort of, if you don't have limitations, you speed up a bit. <laughs> and then when it's really nice, you might be more like, okay, I'm not in a rush, I'm enjoying the, the sun or, yeah. But they, they indeed have made that kind of analysis and I, I found it like surprising because I have the same kind of experience, of course, as you do. Yeah, and, and maybe uh, now before we start, uh, oh, before we end, sorry, uh, I want to ask you one question about uh, the applicability of accessibility studies in planning. So we know that we, we need to know this information for planning for cities and, and uh, functional and healthy cities. Uh, but, but what about uh, what about the public-private partnership here? Density matters, and uh, if we plan for services, and so that services should be accessible for everyone on an equal basis. So public services, we can plan better. But what about private services? What about also uh, private uh, transport modes? So whether they are accessible for different people in different cities? So are they? do you also see that actually private services are more uh, available in those car-oriented centers or in city center where there is a lot of more density of people because of the utility of the economic uh, benefit and output and how to plan how to plan cities so that there is the residential uh, density is very low then also those people have access decent access to services that they need well that yeah I don't know. So, of course, private com or private like sector can't be forced. But of course, what can be done is to be creating good, uh, for example, public transportation network uh, to be directing people to certain directions so that there would be an easy access from the road, like network perspective to certain locations, which would be such that they are equally accessible or well accessible for for different groups of people. And then maybe one thing that can be done is that we have, for example, from, from Espoo and Helsinki, uh, different like neighborhood municipalities, different strategies that Espoo has been in, in terms of libraries as a public service. Espoo has been taking uh, libraries to uh, shopping centers because that's where people are. And those are usually non, not very well accessible with public transportation and they are unpleasant walking environments and so on around them. Whereas Helsinki has taken a decision that they provide uh, local library services so, so that it's like 15 minutes city idea that people not using that concept, but still that's how the network is being built, that there is a library in every corner. And then of course, uh, with this, like, I think that with this kind of ESPO approach, you only strengthen the idea that everyone is drawn because of public services, private services, everything to be same centers. Whereas with location of private or public services, you can still direct a bit the patterns of, of movement. So maybe that's the only thing, like creating places, lo lo location, creating transportation network, and then creating a push for people, need for people to come to other places than those which are remote for some. Like postal offices and elections in low desks. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It was already an hour ago we started. Was there a term like linguistic landscape? Oh, no. the first. Linguistic. Yeah, linguistic landscape. You yeah. started. Uh, yeah. Can you a little bit? 
you know, uh, explain or accessibility and linguistic landscape for... Did I talk about linguistic landscape? I, I did it for the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, just, just some words. Okay. Okay, well, no, I, I, I didn't think about linguistic landscaping in this case, and if I used the term, then it was sort of... Maybe, maybe, but maybe it was... Yeah, we do do uh, work on linguistic landscapes as well. Uh, so people on in terms of this socio-spatial interactions sphere, uh, so some of our researchers are, are studying linguistic landscapes. Uh, and how that relates to accessibility, then, uh, one can think that not at all, uh, but... Actually, if we think that what do what do you get exposed to when doing your everyday trips, uh, and when having your sort of accessibility landscape around you, one way of analyzing it would be the potential of interaction between different people as well. Like how much you could get exposed to different types of people, and then linguistic landscape, meaning in this case the variation of the of the different languages that you can hear or see. Uh, would be one interesting topic of, of analysis. Uh, and that would tell about the environment where you do your trip in and whether you have a possibility to be sort of exposed to, to other types of people, for example, than yourself or just to a diversity of people. So maybe that's sort of quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And with uh, that one, that question, we now um, stop our today's lecture. So thank you once again uh, for this fantastic, very nice uh, lecture uh, for us. We continue our discussions based on that, and we also implement the, the ideas that we heard and discussed today in, in our practical works. And then next week, in one week, we will have a lecture uh, given by Professor Margaret Kutte from Aalto University, and she will talk about place-based methods in the study of urban mobility and participatory transport planning. So welcome again in a week. Thank you for today. Bye-bye.